Hello guys and welcome back to my YouTube channel. In this video I'm going to be talking about how I went from an undergraduate student in chemistry who wanted to drop out of STEM to becoming a radio chemist. Well, I'm technically not a radio chemist just yet. I am in my PhD and I soon will become a radio chemist. I'm here to help you figure out if you want to do a PhD too. And then we can be in the PhD club together, which is sometimes the I love my life club and sometimes the I hate my life club. And we're going to talk about both. <laughs> But let's get right into the video because I got lots to talk about. So I did my undergraduate degree in chemistry. I started off as a general science student. I didn't even want to go to university, which is the funny part. My parents literally forced me to go. I did not get good grades in high school. I was a terrible student. I never handed in my assignments and I hated being in class. But like every optimistic undergrad, I was like, what if I became a doctor or something? So I'm going to do science. And funny enough, in my first year, I wasn't really passionate about any of the courses, but that's because as a first year student, as you guys might know, if you're in your undergrad, you just get a really brief overview of an entire subject and you never really get to dive deep into any of the topics as a first year student. So I just really wasn't invested. But then as a second year student, I took second year organic chemistry and I was hooked. My professor was a nut job, but he was the best lecturer I've had to this date. And he's an inspiration of mine. He just made chemistry so fun. And I was like, I want to be you. I'm going to be a professor too. So I decided to major in chemistry. As a chemistry major, I also decided to enroll in the co-op program, which is essentially one more year to your degree. And you have to do three, four month work terms. I did my first co-op in a cosmetic chemistry type discipline. My second co-op was more of an analytical chemistry type research position. That's my landlord. He's always working in the yard. I'm not sure why he always has yard work, but there's always work to be done. So had to close my window. And if I'm being real with you, I did not enjoy my first two co-ops. I was literally like, if this is what a career in STEM looks like, this is not my trajectory. I want to drop out. Maybe I'll become a realtor. Who knows? But I wanted to complete my co-op degree. So I applied for a third co-op and I seen the particle accelerator had posted a co-op position. So Triumph, the Canadian nuclear particle accelerator. And I was like, why not? I'm gonna just apply. I applied, there was one interview and I ended up getting the job. I show up to Triumph and I have my mentor, which is a PhD student at the time. And I literally told her, I do not see myself having a career in STEM. I'm probably going to drop out as soon as I get this degree. And she was like, all right, let's take a deep breath and just have some fun. And she asked me to go into the four months with her with just an open mindset. And that's exactly what I did. And here I am. I'm now doing a PhD with the exact same PI in the exact same field at the exact same particle accelerator. So if you are an undergraduate student or if you are in high school, I do recommend doing co-op because you get to dip your toes in different fields of chemistry and each field is very, very different. So just because you hate one doesn't mean you're not going to like another discipline of chemistry. So don't give up till you find something that you like because life is long. You might as well enjoy what you do. And if I were to give one piece of advice, it would be to find a really, really good mentor while you are a young scientist because STEM is very hard. You not only have to love what you do, but you really do need somebody to look up to and guide you because they've already done everything that you want to do. So in my opinion, it is very important. And I know it was monumental for me to have a good mentor that I could seek out for advice when I was down in the gutter and wanted to We've all been there though. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> all right. So that's kind of a summary of my undergraduate degree. So let's move into my master's. I did my master's at the particle accelerator once again, and I did it with the same PI. So the PI is the principal investigator. And this would be the woman that my PhD student, which was my mentor during my co-op worked for but now my main boss is the PI. While I was a co-op student, I didn't interact really with the PI, but then as a master's student, she became my mentor and the person that I would go to for weekly meetings or to seek out advice from. And the reason I started off in a master's degree rather than doing a direct PhD, which is also an option, is because I wanted to make sure that the dynamic between me and my PI was positive and a place where I thought I could grow. And I needed to make sure that we got along because like I said, the relationship with your mentor or your PI, whoever you are working for in STEM is very, very, very important. It is literally a make or break. I've heard stories where the PI literally broke the student or made the student the best version of themselves. 
And after two years in the master's program, I was really enjoying myself and I love my PI, she's amazing. So I decided to do the master's transfer to a PhD, where a transfer to a PhD is essentially a committee meeting. You do like a 20 to 40 minute presentation and there's an hour question period where your committee members, which are two other people in the department at your school, they ask you about the research that you've done thus far and they also ask you about your future directions and then any theory within your discipline. And then you essentially get a pass or fail type grade. And I passed. So here I am, a PhD student in chemistry. All right, that was kind of my career trajectory thus far. So now I want to talk about what radiochemistry is and the research that I do. Briefly, radiochemistry is a very interdisciplinary field. So it not only covers biology, chemistry, specifically organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry, radiochemistry, and also nuclear physics. So what I do, I specifically develop radioactive drugs. The type of radioactive drug that I develop is called a radiopharmaceutical. They are generally made up of four components. So you have what's called a chelator. And this is what I synthesize as an organic chemist in the lab. And the chelator acts as a cage and it binds what's called a radio metal. So a radioactive metal that harnesses all this energy that's capable of breaking DNA. So treating cancer or imaging cancer, depending on the type of radioactive decay that the radio metal ion undergoes during its decay process, a linker group, and then what's known as a targeting vector, which is essentially like a little vehicle that will search out specific biomarkers on the surface of cancerous cells, bind to them. And then since the chelator, which is a cage, brought the radioactive metal to that cancerous site because it was conjugated to the targeting vector, the radioactive metal then is undergoing radioactive decay and it can either image or treat disease. Right now, I specifically do the synthesis of chelators. So I will like buy some starting material and then synthesize either a derivative of an existing organic molecule that binds radioactive metals, or I can take a known chelator and then conjugate it to what I was explaining earlier, which is a targeting vector. And then if you have the chelator attached to a targeting vector, well, then you can perform like animal studies. So right now I purely do synthesis. I work in an organic chemistry lab and I synthesize the chelators, which are just organic molecules. So I just mix chemicals together in flasks, cross my fingers and then get a product. I'm, I'm joking, kind of. And then once you synthesize a chelator, well, you need to characterize it. So you characterize the chelator by, for example, nuclear magnetic resonance or X-ray crystallography. And then you can visualize your chelator in the solid state. And better yet, if you can get a crystal structure of your chelator bound to the non-radioactive version of the radioactive metal that you're going to pursue, then you can see, well, how is this chelator binding this metal? If binding it at all, which doesn't necessarily translate to what's going to occur in vitro, but it's still insightful. And it's just pretty cool in general to have a crystal structure. So this is very different than what I did as a co-op student. As a co-op student, I was a purification chemist. So I worked with radioactivity all the time where you essentially, you make a solid target. You bring this target to the cyclotron operators who irradiate this target on the cyclotron. So they bombard it with particles. So then the target becomes hot and hot means radioactive. Then you dissolve this target once it's done on the cyclotron in usually hot acid. And then the radioactivity would be in solution. Once it's in solution, well then you can purify it by column chromatography. And then the goal is to separate and purify specific radioactive metals. And the scale when it comes to purifying radioactive metals is very, very small. Like my columns were literally like 50 milligrams, like this big. Me personally, I like synthesis better because for me, it's a little bit scary working with the radioactivity, but there is a theory that small exposure to the radioactivity will end up preventing cancer, but that is very controversial. That's all I had planned on talking about in this video. I hope this video was helpful. If you have any questions, please leave them down in the comment box down below. But overall, I am so happy with where I am today in my life. I've never been more grateful and appreciative for the place that I'm in. I mean, I always have hard days just like everybody does. But overall, I am so grateful to be doing my PhD in radiochemistry, such an interdisciplinary field where I can learn new things. And I definitely would recommend it. And like I said previously, if you are not passionate about what you're doing right now, just keep on trying different fields until you find something that you're passionate about. Because when you're passionate about something, it really makes the work you do mean a lot more. And like I always say, 
passion will beat out innate intelligence every single time. So find what you love and don't stop trying until you do. Love you guys so much. If you made it this far, please make sure to leave a like, comment, save, and or subscribe to my channel. And let me know what type of videos you want me to make. If you have a specific video in mind, then please also comment that down in the comment box below. And let me know we're all in this together once we know. Okay, just stop talking now, Simona. <laughs> Slay. <laughs>